computer. I think I'm recording. It's it says yeah. recording. <laughs> recording. Great. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I guess I'll have to repeat all the stuff that we've already just spoke about. But uh, essentially, the idea today is um, three strangers who uh, have sort of met through social media, uh, various forms of it, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, um, and are wanting to basically share a story. A aside from being devilishly handsome, young, good-looking and fun, uh, we've, we've all had cancer. Um, you know, anybody watching, let's just wait that, wait, let, let that sink in and let everybody get over the shock. I'm sure you guys probably get it all the time when you, when you talk to people and you actually say the word, it's like, wow, people like, don't know how to react to you. They're like, oh my God, like, wow. Um, but I guess today is just about raising awareness. Uh, we've all been in positions where we've had it. Thankfully, we've all got over it and come out the other side and we're all looking to um, share our experience, share help, uh, how, we, how we found it, anything that we can to help anybody who's got any questions or just generally people are just wondering. So um, most people, because I'm going to, I said, I'm going to put this on my Instagram, but I guess if you guys are putting it on yours as well. So, so my story was um, three years ago. Yeah. Three years ago. Um, completely out of the blue. Was not expecting it as, as most people probably aren't, but um, started to feel um, not a lump, but one of my testicles was, just harder and bigger and just didn't feel right. Uh, I ignored it like most people do for uh, a little bit, but fortunately not for ages, um, which, which thank God I didn't. And um, went on holiday, came back from holiday, thought still something not right, went to the doctors and literally within a week was in the hospital having tests. And I think within two weeks was on the operating table having an operation. So it was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, but thank God I went to the doctors because there's just so many people who would have just waited and gone, oh, well, I'll just see how it goes for a, another month or another two months. And, you know, they, that can be the difference. I've, I've known people who um, have let things go or not even gone and gotten checked. And, and it's resulted in, in, unfortunately, pretty bad situation. So, so thank God I did. Um, but, yeah, at, at the same time, I never expected that day I went to the doctors to, for him to basically say, you need to go to hospital this afternoon and get an x-ray. It was a bit like, I thought I'd go in and he'd go, oh, don't worry about it, you're fine. You just, you know, banged it playing football or whatever. It's a normal thing. And literally, um, it went from there. So, um, now mine was, was three, three years ago. Um, so I'm quite a long way down the road to sort of, this new journey I'm on of like recovery and um, spreading awareness. But you guys, I think you guys are both in a similar, similar time frame. So Christy, do you want to tell us a little bit about your situation, your story? Yeah. Yeah. So basically um, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer uh, July 3rd last year. Uh, you always remember that date. That date never goes from your head. Yeah. Um, so I I actually had a baby um, in December 2019. And what happened was I I sort of, you know, had a post-pregnancy belly. was not sort of too worried about it. But then all of a sudden, like, my belly just started getting more, like, rounded. And it looked more like bloating rather than just a post-pregnancy belly. But, of course, because I'd just been pregnant, I just assumed that it was normal and that it was a uh, it was just a part of uh, giving birth and then it just got to the point where my belly looked like I was about 20 weeks pregnant again all of a sudden um so I went to the the um, hospital just like you know, Rob didn't have a bloody clue what was going on in the middle of a pandemic as well so the last thing I wanted to do was actually go to A&E and then, uh, <laughs> went into A&E was crapping myself while I was in there because I was like oh my god I'm gonna catch COVID but little did I realise at the time that there was something much far worse going on than COVID in my life. So, wow. um, yeah, I basically went in. I thought they were going to tell me that there was just like wrong with my stomach muscles or something. And the next thing I know, they're admitting me overnight. The next morning, I'm having a CT scan. 
and they find this um, eight pound cyst <laughs> inside of me. Mm -hmm. um, so this thing was 29 centimeters long, 16 centimeters wide, and I didn't have a clue it was there for six months nearly. So it was absolutely crazy. Um, so they, they actually nicknamed ovarian cancer as a silent cancer anyway, because because of that, because it can grow so big without yeah. you even realizing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so just like Rob, I was like <clears throat> shocked to my core. Um, what actually happened in that week following is the cyst burst. Um, so I was really, really ill all of a sudden. Um, and then I was on the operating table within seven days of my first A&E admission, mm. um, having that taken out. Um, and the, I suppose, like, just like you were saying, like the early diagnosis is the real key part here i was uh, what they call a stage 1c which is where it was localized to the cyst but the cyst at first um if i had have gone to the doctors just one week earlier i would have avoided chemotherapy completely wow wow yeah. that is crazy so it's it's and i tell you what um no one wants to go through chemotherapy like ever mm. Um, it's it's just the most horrendous experience and you put your life on the line just going through the experience you're kind of fighting for your life but also doing risking your life at the same it's just the weirdest experience um so early diagnosis is key um in my case obviously as i say my my post-pregnancy barely was my 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 excuse mm -hmm. then it was oh, i've eaten too much because we're in lockdown <laughs> <laughs> um but you know as I say, one week earlier, um, I could have had the surgery and then just been on a surveillance program for the next five years, whereas I had to go through nine weeks of grueling, grueling chemotherapy, um, one of the highest dose chemotherapies out there. Um, mm -hmm. I lost my hair, started growing back and everything, and it was just horrendous, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, my God, that's, that's terrible. And, and Joe, go on then. Before I ask any questions, I've got loads of questions for you already, Christy. Go on, Joe, tell us, tell us yours. Um, so I... The, in my family, we've got a history of breast cancer. So my mum had breast cancer in 2012 and my auntie had it way back when I was like 15 or something. She was 38, but she actually died of breast cancer. Um, so I've always been really aware of it, but stupidly never checked myself, like just because I was too scared of what I might find. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. literally one night I was laying in bed and I had an itch and I scratched it and I thought I felt a lump. and. Uh, yeah, I was like, you know, you think, is that something? Is it? Is it a lump? And then, so of course, like over the next day, I kept feeling it. I thought, no, there's definitely something there. So on the Monday, I went to the doctor, um, and I had a letter with like the family history from when my mum had her cancer. Mm -hmm. So I gave that to them, and they were like, like, well, you know, it'd be a two-week referral. But um, the next day, I got an appointment for the following Monday. Went for that appointment. I didn't realise you got the results on the day, so I went by myself. Well, see, so this was like during COVID as well, uh, sort of end of June last year. And uh, yeah, so I had a mammogram, had an ultrasound and a biopsy, and then like everyone was getting called back in and I'm still sitting there like, why am I not getting called back in? Why? Like, it's getting closer to five o'clock, people are going home. Like why, why have I not got called back in? And then um, they called me in and she said, oh, your mammogram's clear, but the ultrasound found something, but we don't know what, and I just, I, I lost it. I just completely crumbled. Like, mm. and because you just think the worst, don't you? you? Just think, oh my god! Like, and at that stage, I hadn't even said like it's definitely cancer. Um, so I, yeah. So anyway, like, the they said, oh, you need to have an MRI to see because obviously, because you're under forty, your mammogram quite often is clear when you're sort of younger. And um, yeah, so. I was meant to go for the MRI, but before then, they called me in for another appointment. And it was on the 29th of June last year. And uh, yeah, again, I went by myself because you don't think you're going to get a cancer <laughs> diagnosis, do you? Yeah. And yeah, and then found out it was stage one, grade one breast cancer. So it was small. It was only a centimetre. So I'd sort of found it early. And, you know, I just, I just think to myself, like, oh, my God, if I hadn't have scratched, would I know now? Mm -hmm. Would I still be none the wiser? Like, and then um, 
yeah, so I, but when, when they actually said it was cancer, I was really calm because I was I'd gone in there expecting them to say it's stage four, it's terminal. Like I was just I oh, convinced really? myself okay. that it was gonna be the worst case scenario. So mm -hmm. I was really, really calm and um like I was just like, Well what what now? And she said, Oh well we we like to operate in thirty days, but you need to have an MRI because obviously we need to make sure there's nothing else. So I had the MRI the following week. And that picked up a second lump that was smaller and deeper. So I, w I would never have found it. Like it yeah. was when when they ultrasound it to do the biopsy, they were pressing so hard because it was so deep. Um, and then that one turned out to be stage one, grade one breast cancer as well. So oh. but, I mean, there oh. was so like on they're like it, it's this, it's stage one, grade one. But when we operate, it could be more. It could be bigger. It could be more advanced. We won't know if you need chemo until you've been operated on. And there's just so many like, what ifs, what ifs, but you know, yeah. what now, what now sort of thing. Did you go through chemo then? Did you have chemo? I didn't, no. Um, no. So because of the family history, I was genetically tested okay. and luckily that was negative. If that had been positive, then I would have needed chemo. Yeah. Um, and again, because it was stage one, grade one, if it had been any more advanced, then I would have needed chemo. And then there's mm. another hormone that they look for and if that had been present then I would have needed chemo so at the initial stage I didn't know it was mm -hmm. you, it just depends you have to wait for these other results to come back yeah and um, so but yeah I, I just needed radiotherapy and now I'm on to oxygen now so okay I think that's highlighted there uh, the three of us have just told our, our sort of stories obviously you guys both um during during lockdown and covid which is it seems when I, I actually thought about both of you when I was out running this morning, um, oh, we lost Christy, is she? I don't know if she's there. That's fine. Yeah, I, thought, I, thought about, <laughs> I thought about both of you this morning when I was running, uh, obviously building up to this conversation and what we're going to talk about. And um, like, because I've started the running thing sort of since, I guess, yeah, since, since you know, having cancer. Um, but, you know, with running and exercise and anything like that, you're sort of always monitoring yourself in terms of, you know, how far am I coming? And, and my thoughts this morning on this run were like, oh, how many miles have I done since um, March in 2020, whatever it was? Uh, because I think I'd seen someone on Instagram where uh, it was like a year to the day yesterday since Boris Johnson did the first lockdown announcement. It just got me thinking like, oh, I wonder how much running I've done since then. And, <clears throat> you know, people will be thinking like, oh, bloody hell, I've not been back to the office for a year now. But actually there's, much bigger things going on in the last year than how long you've not been to the office or how many miles running I've done. You two have been through start to finish and, and well, still going actually, so start and, and almost finish through an entire journey of, of cancer. Like while we've been thinking, oh, I can't go to the pub for a drink or out for a meal, this, there's just massive things going on, isn't there? And um, it's, it hits home when you two say like it was during lockdown and during COVID that how recent it is for you both that you've, you've been through that. You know, mine now feels like a lifetime ago. It feels like a different, literally a different life. Um, but it's, I mean, it's only three years. And it always, when I go back to the Christie, um, it always reminds me when I go back in, I think this it like sort of re-engages re re me to think this is real, like, you know, I've, I've gone from having appointments every three months to four to now six. So a long time goes by before I have to go back in again. Then when I go back in, I think, wow, this is, this is actually, uh, you know, this is like a reminder of um, this was pretty serious. You know, it was, uh, I mean, unfortunately, I think we're all, Christy, I mean, oh, God, I wish you'd have, have found, you know, a week early. But fortunately, on the whole, we, we basically, one thing we have in common is that we all found it really early. Um, or early enough um, yeah. to, to still be here. Um, unfortunately, no, like I said, a few people who who didn't. And um, and that's kind of my message. Like I said, I get lots of questions, mainly around like, how did you know? And how did you find it? And all that kind of thing. Did you feel ill? And, um, you know, I had I had one shot of chemotherapy. So nothing like what you had, Christy. And, and that made me feel shit for a week. I was like, oh, I came out about two weeks later. I came out in these, horrendous like really violent cold sores uh, I get cold sores anyway but only very very mild and I came out like two weeks later because obviously it just drops your immune system and you just catch everything and like you just feel 
shit all the time. And, um, and I always remember that and just thinking like, God, I went through one, literally one shot. It was for an hour. I can't remember what it was called, but it was like, you're not going to have any adverse effect. You're not going to lose your hair. Um, you're not going to, they said, you're not going to feel that ill. Um, and it was like an hour of it being dripped into me. And, uh, yeah, for like a week or so, I, I felt really shit. But, um, but God, yeah, you, Chris, you went through, did you say nine weeks? Nine weeks of, I know we were talking for quite a lot of it, weren't we? Yeah. Like Christmas yeah. was more like, you helped me through that a lot. Good, yeah. I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Like, I know you said Christmas was like the end, wasn't it? Like, just before Christmas was going to be like the final thing. And, and you had, you know, I remember told you loads where it was so up and down where you were like, feeling really shit and then all the times you'd be like no I'm, I'm feeling good like it's all right yeah. but then you'd have like another bout of it coming and so what was that it was, like it was that as I kind of mentioned before it was difficult because you know I know I had to go through it because I had a grade three cancer so I had you know the worst type you could possibly have mm -hmm. and uh so I knew I had to go through it and so there was no option basically but it was just horrible because like for example things would happen that would endanger my life in other ways that came from the chemotherapy right. such as I had two blood clots on my lungs I oh, had nice. I was anemic at one point yeah. I had an allergic reaction at one point and ended up in intensive care <laughs> um, and I can go on I can literally go on like the amount of things yeah. that happened and uh you, you just sort of, as you're going through the process, I actually think it's not necessarily, obviously the physical symptoms are god awful. You feel like you're on death, you know, you're just going to die all the mm. time. Mm -hmm. But it's it's the actual, it's the mental part of it that's yeah. difficult with it. Because you know, when you're sat there and that drip's going in your arm, you know that in a few days' time, because it takes a few days to kind of kick in the symptoms, uh -huh you're going to feel like rock bottom and you're yeah. potentially going to have done something to your body that might be irreversible or mm. cause you, a, you know, a bad, you know, a bad time of it. So it's soul destroying to go back in. So I had three cycles and the, fir the first part of the cycle was I went in for five days as a, as an in-stay patient and had eight hours of drip every single day, yeah. five days. And then, a week later I'd go back in just for a day unit so it's just two hours and then another week later it's just two hours so it's a three-week regime and then you start again mm -hmm. so I had three cycles of that I swear down I would not have survived a fourth one no way mm -hmm. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. that was I, by the end of it I mean I before I even started the third cycle I was having like an absolute breakdown about it because I just did not yeah. want to go through with it but yeah. I, you know the nurses are brilliant at Adam Brooks and they, they sat with me. They, they really helped me through that last cycle, but yeah. there's nothing worse than when you feel so ill and you know that you're going to go back into that hospital and be knocked down a hundred times more. <laughs> it's just, it's yeah, the wrong. mental strain yeah. of chemotherapy is unbearable at times. And I think that, as I said, as you said, there were times where I, we were talking and I was saying like, I don't, know if I can cope with this anymore but then like, a couple of days later I'd be fine again because yeah. the symptoms have kind of gone yeah. off but it there is there is no there's nothing in life that is as bad as that that experience yeah. that, that yeah, yeah. you and what in what world would you walk into a room knowing in full health walk into a room and leave with like the tiniest ounce of it <laughs> of your health yeah when you come back out again like yeah. you just wouldn't do it mm. so you know it's it's a psychological uh problem i think chemotherapy really as well as physical yeah, yeah. it's like you, you know it's going to be bad you know you're going to be hit down and it's going to it's going to really affect every aspect of your life but you have to do it and mm -hmm. i i you know i attribute my my focus was my daughter i had to get through it for my daughter mm -hmm. but yeah. you know when people are older, um, for example, they, I can see why they don't go through with it. I really can. And I yeah. now myself would say, if I had to go through an experience like that when I was older and I'd live my life more, I potentially wouldn't have taken that option because really? it, it was that bad. Yeah. So wow. Wow. Um, I would have chose to basically pass away peacefully rather than go yeah. through that. Yeah. So, 
interesting what you yeah. say about the psychological thing like mentally it's it completely changed me completely yeah. changed me in so many ways um from like tiny weird things like i've now got tattoos and i didn't have them before and it's like i just thought fuck it i'm gonna do it like i don't care yeah. um but also just in in generally just in terms of just just strong and just deciding like i'm gonna be as fit as i can be i'm gonna i'm gonna if i want to do this if i want to go on holiday here i'm gonna do it i'm gonna i'm just just everything just sort of changed whereas previously i've been a bit like oh you know kind of just sort of going through and, you know, I've did a bit of sport and stuff. Now I feel like everything I do is, is kind of to the extreme. And I just think, no, I'm going to do it. I'm just, and, it, and it's because of, it's definitely because of that. that I just think like, yeah. I've seen that life can be too short, you know, fortunately not for me, but, but other people that I saw when I was going in there and I'm thinking, you're not getting out of here and I'm wasting mm. my life not doing whatever. And, and it so was it really so did, destroying being yeah, on that camp the ward and watching other people and oh. knowing you could have full well been in that position but yeah. you're not you yeah. kind of feel lucky in a way like were you really not lucky but this is what i say to a, that's that's yeah. one thing i say to a lot of people when we're talking and and people tend to feel you know really sorry for you and they're like oh my god that's awful oh my, it really upsets me to think of you so so ill and and all that kind of thing and i'm like no i'm i'm the lucky one there's there's people in there who didn't get out of there i'm i've had it and i'm all right i'm I'm lucky not and they're like well, you're not lucky because you've had it I think no I'm lucky because of actually I've had it I've come out of the other end and now I get tested and checked every three months which is way more than any any normal person walking around in the world so yeah. um yeah literally it yeah, sounds crazy I think but... I really suffered with guilt like because I thought I was in such a bad place when I finished treatment mm. like mentally I was like really really bad but I felt really guilty because I thought but I'm all right like I was lucky. Like why? Why is it affecting me so badly? Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, there's there's people I follow on Instagram that are terminal, and I just think like it's heartbreak, absolutely heartbreaking reading their stories. And, yeah, you know, and I just think, why are you so upset? Like, but it, you know, yeah, it was really hard. Really yeah, a sense of guilt because I you don't see know how people cope with it. Mm. I actually don't know how they cope with it because it was bad enough knowing that you know I had pretty good chances so even after the chemotherapy they mm. they sort of turned around to me and said oh, this is a very rare cancer you've got but the chemotherapy absolutely melts the cells so you know mm. we'll get it I was saying yeah. they were sort of giving me 95% odds so I knew I was going to be fine really yeah but it you just I just still couldn't accept that I was going to be fine and I, to be honest even now sometimes I still can't accept that I'm okay like it's yeah, yeah. it's really weird mental yeah fuck up basically it, yeah, it, it, just, it really is yeah it yeah. changes you it, it, it does it affects you one thing I'm just thinking about with, with what you've said Christy is is like if you'd have found it a week earlier that must have made going through chemotherapy for that eight weeks even harder to think when when you're at, like you said rock bottom when you're feeling shit and you think yeah i'll just come in a week earlier i wouldn't i wouldn't be sat here having this now i'd be you know you'd, you'd be in a situation like mine which was that i literally went in had uh, had it removed and then that was kind yeah. of it i had a shot of chemotherapy to sort of tidy thing tidy things up and, and was fine and um yeah i think i'd have struggled in your position i can't even imagine being in there but in your position thinking i just come a week earlier. Like, I bet, I don't know. I think I would start thinking, what was I doing a week earlier that, that meant I didn't go in? Yeah, like, I did. Why didn't I do it? And you just torment yourself with that, like, oh, why didn't I do it? Because even now I think to myself, like, you know, I I found it before, it was actually my best friend's wedding. Um, I found it before then, but I thought, it'll be all right. Like, I'll be fine. I just forgot about it, completely forgot about it. We went away for like two weeks for his wedding and a bit of a, like, party after and stuff didn't even think about it and then came back and was like oh hang on a minute that, that feels worse than it was before like I was getting worse and then uh similar I think to uh to you guys story I didn't I didn't tell anybody I went on my own um one of them went in the hospital completely on my own and um yeah and I didn't expect to go in literally you know I went to the doctors on my own he said go down to the hospital and I thought and I thought um, it'll be all right. I could go to hospital, and they'll go, "Oh yeah, it's uh, whatever, something, but nothing, nothing major." Mm. Um, and I struggled with how 
which I appreciate now, but at the time I hated it. How, I want to say brutal, but how brutally honest the nurse was. Um, literally within two minutes of being in the room with her, she was like, okay, so we're looking for cancer. And I was like, that was the first I'd heard of it. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, that's, that's why you're here. And I was like, what? And I was just like, and she's like, that's what it feels like to me. And she was just dead, like, brutally honest. She was like, that's what it feels like to me. That's what I think it is. And I went into, like, um, like a bit of a panic and a bit of a, I, don't, I think, I remember when she told me, I remember saying, oh, I feel a bit like headed. I need to, like, lie down. And I lay down, and she got me a water and stuff. Uh, kind of how I used to get when I had a needle. I used to be frightened to death of needles. I'd pass out. Mm. And it was that kind of... Uh, but just her saying that, and I was like, it just like felt all the blood rush from my head, and I just thought, what? what you just thinking? And I think I remember saying things to her like, yeah, yeah, but like, what else could it be? She was like, no, nothing really. And I was like, nothing at all. Like, what? I played football the other night, and she was just like, no. And she was, and I, I remember coming out and thinking, obviously waiting for the test results, and thinking, oh, bitch, like. How can she be so <laughs> horrible? Yeah, and but now yeah. I look back and I think, thank God for that because that was the first time I'd heard that that's what it was, and that kind of then I'm sat there for like I think it was three hours I had to wait for the test results, and um, it's only near my house, the hospital. So I walked out, walking around near my house, just aimlessly walking around, just thinking like, right, and I'm sort of preparing mentally, preparing myself that that's what it was going to be. She'd almost convinced me that's what it was going to be. Um, so I wandered around three hours and then I went back in. And then when they told me in the test results, they were like, okay, so it is what we thought it was. I was like, I was all right at that point. I was kind of just like, yeah, like I, I sort of, I'd come to terms with it in a, in some weird way. But then it was like all the, the scaredness of like, okay, well, what happens now? Like what, what's next? Like, um, okay. and then it was, you know, they, they taught you, they're, you know, they're amazing. The, the way they treat people with cancers, I, the NHS and the Christie, I literally cannot fault them. Like I've done loads of fundraising because I was just blown away by it. But they were, they, you know, talked me through the whole thing and said, right, we're going to find a date for you to have the operation. Um, I was like, okay, yeah. And then I went about my normal day, went back to work the next day. Um, and then literally got, I think that was on the Monday, went back to work on the Tuesday, Wednesday, got a call on the Thursday saying, oh, can you come in tomorrow? We'll, we'll, we'll do it tomorrow. And I was like, whoa, right. Um, I was trying to think of like reasons why I couldn't. And then some of my mates were like, just go and get it done. You've got to get it done. So just go and get it done. So literally within, by the end of the week, I was in and uh, yeah, having an operation and, and then lay there for nine hours waiting for the operation, Googling what it was, all kinds of stuff that you, you know, Google can be the, your best friend and your enemy, can't it, when you start Googling things. But yeah. Um, it's just crazy. I made a joke yeah. while I was in hospital. I was like, well, you know when you do that thing where you Google online and you always have cancer? Well, this time it was true. When I was waiting for mine, I was Googling. It was like, oh, mammograms are more accurate than ultrasound. So I kind of like went in thinking, no, I was trying to convince myself, like, on what either it was going to be the worst case scenario or I was going to be absolutely fine. And yeah. even like you said, Rob, when they felt it and they, like she said to you, no, it feels like it's cancer. And um, when I saw the nurse, the doctor, she was like, oh, no, I know my breast lumps and it feels it doesn't feel like anything sinister. It just feels like a normal cyst. And yeah. then even when I saw in the hospital, she was like the registrar. She was like, oh, it just feels like a cyst, but we'll get it checked. But then when I actually saw my surgeon and she felt it, she said that feels like a typical cancerous lump to me. So yeah. I was like, you even need to train those people. Yeah, you get annoyed at them, don't you? Well, they were trying to make me feel better. But yeah. You know, it's funny, like, see, you, you kind of were thrown off the path a bit there because you were like, oh, well, everyone else is saying that, you know, it's fine. Yeah. And then all of a sudden someone come in, whereas Rob knew from the beginning. Yeah. Like, in my situation, I got diagnosed with a dermoid cyst at first. I had one of them. Uh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Horrible little things, <laughs> uh, or big things in my case. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I got diagnosed with a dermoid cyst, and they turned around to me and went, "Oh, don't worry, ninety-eight percent of them are non-cancerous." So I was like, "Hey, hunky dory, you know, absolutely yeah. fine." Um, then it burst, 
Um, and then I was in hospital. And then the next thing I know is I'm being pulled into this room and they're saying to me, um, we're not hundred percent sure, but we think there might be some cancerous changes in your cyst. And I was like, well, where, where, where did that come from? It's just, yeah. it was like an absolute curveball all of a sudden. Mm. Cancer hadn't even been like mentioned up until that point. Yeah, and yeah. then all of a sudden, I'm, in, I'm, I'm being sent home to wait for results. And then I get a phone call about 12 hours later. It was barely anything. Where they'd sent my scans off to Anbrooks, which is the cancer specialist around here. They'd taken one look and they sent me, they phoned me at six o'clock in the evening and went, are you okay? Because <laughs> there was like all this fluid in, inside of me and everything. And they're like, you need to come to hospital right now. <laughs> so oh the, hospital made, the other hospital made a terrible mistake letting yeah. me go. Um, yeah. But to be honest, I, I'm not going to lie, I completely misused morphine and just uh, went home <laughs> with loads of it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> that's how I got through the whole process. Is like, can I have some more morphine, please? I go <laughs> sleep, thanks. <laughs> What always amazes me, and, and I, I don't know about you guys, uh, it's not, not you, Joe, because you said you'd had it in your, in your family, but I'd basically been completely sheltered from anything like this, really, my whole life. I'd never known anybody, never, never known anybody that had had it. Um, I'd seen stuff on TV, and they were always dead old, dead old people. Mm. And I literally, completely, like, immaturely, really, you know, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm age 27, and I'm thinking... Ah, cancer's like, yeah, I know young people get it, but not really. Like, old people get it. Like, it doesn't happen to young people. And then I got it, and then I'm like, wow, right. And then I'm in the Christie, and literally everybody in there is is young. Like, not everybody, but 90% of people in there are in their 30s, in the 40s, and normal people, you know, people coming in. Like, I remember a guy coming in, and he was covered in pain. Um, he was a painter and decorator and he'd, he'd come in and he'd literally just been working all day and I was like I just used to chat to people and some people were a bit like didn't want to talk to you rightly so like but other people did I thought I'll, I'll talk to him and, and he was like yeah I just finished work yeah and he was just dead blase about it but he was like yeah I've, I've got testicular cancer and I was thinking people are just going about their normal days but they're all young they're all young you know or whatever 20 to 40 year old people they're not you know and I was thinking at 27 thinking how have i gone this many years thinking that cancer only gets old people and doesn't really bother with young people and it's all right i know hundreds of people and i've never known anyone that's had it so yes i know all these websites and adverts and cancer research say it's one in two but it's not really one in two is it because i'm thinking like i know i've got 10 mates who i'm pretty close with and none of us have had it so by their their you know numbers, it should five of us should have it. And I was thinking, I work in an office with three hundred people, and I didn't know anybody that had it. And I was just thinking, yeah, it's one in two, but it, it's not really. But until you actually get it, and then I guess it's because of the people and certainly through social media and and sharing my story that I've become friends with people who've who've had it or got it or thought they had it and didn't have it or whatever. And now I know loads of people who've who've had it or, or a some way along to, uh, but it's just, I can't believe it took that to make me realize that, oh, actually this does happen to young people. And, and mm. even now that's the message I try to spread to anybody is like, if you go to the doctors and you're a bit worried, particularly with guys, because it is, it's a guy, I think girls are more likely to go to the doctors. A guy, with a swollen testicle is going to go, I'm not going to the doctors letting him, like, I'm fine, don't worry, it's all bravado in it, and thank God it wasn't for me, but, but um, there's just some sort of thing attached to people going, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that, like, but I've had now people say, like, oh, how did you find it, and, and how did you know, and I'm like, I always say to people, look, you go to the doctors, and he, I'm, I'm crude about it, I'm like, and he feels your dick, and then he says, you're fine, and you walk away, then that's, so. you know, who cares? So what? You've been there. You've got the reassurance. You've come away. Um, and I think there's, there's still that thing now where guys in particular would be more reluctant to go to the doctors because they're like, oh, I'm, not having, I'm not having another guy. It's just we need to lose that and just be like, yeah. if you feel like there's something that isn't right, even if you've been completely over – cautious and, and ridiculous just go like you've wasted if you if you go and it happens to be not that you've wasted 10 minutes of a doctor's time who's told you 
yeah, you're fine. But yeah. he could be like me and go, and he goes, yeah, there's a problem here. Because um, I put it off loads. I think I cancelled the appointment three times and thought, oh, no, I'm, I'm all right, I'm all right. And then thought, no, maybe I'm not all right. Um, but obviously, suppose, different for you, the, Oh, go on, Christy. Sorry. I suppose the thing that's um, kind of similar in women, shall we say, is the smear mm. test. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one thing that women avoid is the smear tests, which is the one thing they should not avoid. Yes, no, definitely. <laughs> which is like a similar scenario, isn't it? Like everything else, like women, as you say, don't care so much about like, you know, oh, I've got to go to the doctors and get my boob touched or whatever. You know, yeah. no one really cares about that. But mm. for some reason, everyone cares about the smear test, even though it doesn't hurt. It's just uncomfortable. Yeah. So, and it's literally like a minute of your time. Mm. But, like, I know my, one of my friends has recently been diagnosed with cervical cancer because she and she has luckily she was at stage two and they've been able to save her. But I've also known three other friends who have had abnormal cells in the last year um, from their smear tests and now being kept a very close eye on. Yeah. And you just think for, you know, for that one minute of your time, like you're saying, for, for that 10 minutes of the time with the doctor. Mm-hmm. It is so worth it. Just do yeah. it, you know. Yeah, really. That's so, what I say for anyone, like, if you're if, uh, every month, I post this thing on Instagram, like that, checking your boobs, and um, like anything. If you find anything, just go. Yeah. Like, just go because I, I always thought I'd be one of these people. That, oh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. But I, I'm quite proud of myself. But I went as soon as I did. Yeah. Like, no, I'm saying. Yeah. I got you know got yeah. diagnosed within two weeks of like yeah. going. So, and yeah. then was operated on within six weeks, I think. So, yeah, so, like just was it and... different for you, Joe? Because obviously, you said you've you've sort of grown up with it around you with your auntie and, and your mum. I guess were you more like I'm saying? Obviously, I wasn't. I was completely sheltered from it and just thought, ah, this doesn't happen. But I don't know. I guess your mum and your auntie were probably fairly young when they got it. So, well, were you more have... open to being like this yeah. can happen to young people? Well, when my mum got it, my mum was 62 and the doctor said to her, oh, you'll be fine. It's an old lady's cancer. You'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And like she, she had to go through chemo, but hers was a different type to mine. Right. Um, but um, yeah, so even, even, but then saying that, even though I was aware of it, I still didn't check myself, stupidly, yeah. like, because I was scared. I was so yeah, scared. It's the fear yeah, you don't want to find it, do you? Yeah, because I thought if I find something, I'm not going to want to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, like... But because I've got an older sister, she's 10 years older than me. And when our mum was diagnosed, I remember saying to her, if one of us is going to get it, it's going to be me. And she's like, oh, don't say that. I was like, no, it's going to, it's going to be me. I just, you know, you just know, like. It's weird that you say that. Yeah. Like, you know, but for me, I think the biggest thing for me was like, it sounds really stupid, but like I was in, you know, just being told you've got cancer. And I was just like, what's my boob going to look like? Like, that's what I was yeah. worried about. Like, yeah. what, what, <laughs> am I going to be lopsided? Like, <laughs> so that was kind of. Like I said to you the other day, Rob. Like, I don't feel like I don't sort of think. Oh yeah, I've had cancer. I can't mm. can't put the two together. I mean, you head around it, yeah. It's just this thing that happened to me, and mm. now I've got this huge scar to remind me of it forever. But yeah, but that's a, sometimes that's a good thing because it does remind you, doesn't it? And it reminds you where you've been, and, and you know all that kind of thing, and. And that's funny, like you said, oh, what's my... I never actually thought that um, until the day when I was late. Like I said, they made me get there at 8am and uh, and then they probably like they do with you guys in the operation. They're like, your operation will be sometime between 9 and 4. Yeah. Typically, mine was literally 10 to 4. I lay there all day and I filled in these forms in the morning to basically say, um, yeah, take it out. It's consent to whatever you need to do. Um, but... Uh, also put a fake one in um when you know so i ticked that i thought yeah because i don't know what it's going to look like with like <laughs> i was thinking yeah maybe it'd be lopsided so but yeah, I didn't yeah even know they could it. do fake ones that's yeah, interesting yeah, they do fake ones. <laughs> so anyway then i sat there all day well i sat there for about four hours and i thought right, I'm, I'm literally i've run out of things to do there's only so much scrolling and whatever else you can do so i've like, run out of stuff to do and i thought i know what i'll google uh, as we just talked about, I'll Google fake uh, fake testicles. So I did that, and uh, God, I got deep into some forums of people talking about them, and I was like, bloody, I didn't realise how many people have, have got this. And obviously reading all the pros and cons, and then I started to think, maybe I don't, maybe I don't want it. Do I want it? And I'm thinking, 
you need to decide because they could call you in a minute for your operation. And I was thinking, and then literally about half three, I started reading this forum and one guy had put on there, um, why would you, it really hit home. He said, why would you have an operation to remove something that shouldn't be there and replace it with something that shouldn't be there? Meaning a plastic but And I thought, that's literally genius. And I just thought, <laughs> it's absolutely right. Why would I take something out that's upsetting my body because it shouldn't be there and replace it with a plastic or whatever? And then, and then I started reading other parts of the form that I'd filled in. And it was saying like, you know, the like, uh, whatever it's called, like not the terms and condition, but the, you know, the, the things that could happen. It was like, it could, your body could reject it. And it could, yeah. the, the things that could potentially go wrong, your body could reject it, this, this, this. So I called the guy in. I said, when your body rejects something, I said, what happens? He said, well, we'd, we'd operate again and remove it. And I thought, what am I doing here? Why am I getting it? Like, what does it matter? If, if you've got to that stage with, with somebody where you're getting intimate and they turn around and go, oh, hang on a minute. you only got one more. I'm interested in this. That's, we're not, you know what I mean? If you get to that stage, it's not going to happen, is it? So I just thought... No. Forget this. I was like, I'm not having it. Um, and then, literally, as I was going in, I said to him, "Oh, I don't, I don't want the, uh, I don't want the fake one." And and the surgeon actually said to me, he "Went, I think that's a good idea." And then next thing, and I was, oh, I was knocked out. Yeah, and, and so I never had one. So um, I, I had three options. I because then um, they because because I had the two lumps. Like they take the lump and then they have to take however big the lump is. They mm. take that much tissue from around. Right. So my lump was a centimetre, but I was going to lose three centimetres all the way around. Okay. And then the other one was like just over half a centimetre. So she sort of said it was like a cheesecake slice. I thought, well, I'm a pig. I eat a lot of cheesecake. <laughs> I eat cheesecake. But she said, that's what you're going to lose. Like, it's going to be a big chunk of your boob. Yeah. And then, yeah. um, so I had, she said they can do this thing where they take back fat. So they sort of like just flip it round. Um, oh, okay. I went and she was she was brilliant, my surgeon. Like she actually came with me to see a plastic surgeon to discuss really? op discuss options. Yeah, so wow. um, I could have had a mastectomy and then an implant, mm. um, a mastectomy and a reconstruction using stomach fat. But he said it would have been smaller if I mm. had that option. Or he said you have got enough fat fat just to sort of flip it round. So I was a bit like, why have I got to make that choice? Like, mm -hmm. what's the best thing to do? Like, yeah, just do that, that was horrible. Me. Yeah, because it's like, what do I do? So I went with the back fat. Mm. So they literally, yeah, they just, whatever they take out, they take from your back and flip it around and fill the hole. Fill the hole. It's crazy, isn't it? It's amazing, really, really clever what they do. Yeah, but, um, but obviously, when she said compromise to that, she said, if you just have the, the lumps removed, you don't have a big skull. But mm. now I've got this, it goes like round the sides and across the back. And I'm totally numb, all like from my armpit oh, down. Yeah. I've got no feeling at all, and like, yeah. I've got reduced mobility in my arm as well. Right. Yeah. I was always interested actually in that when I, I didn't realise until I woke up where they'd where they'd cut me, um, which is crazy. I'd I'd honestly gone in there thinking they're taking the testicle out. I'm gonna have a scar down my ball sack, and I woke up. And it, like they were all up here, like up my up the side of my stomach. Well, not the side of my stomach, but like my like hip area. And I was like, really? Yeah. So I said to him, I said, where have you cut? And he was like, oh, we cut literally down your groin, but quite high up near your hip, down your groin, and then we go down into your ball sack, and then and then take it out that way. And I was like, genuinely thought I was going to wake up and have a stitch like stitch line up my yeah, but but I didn't. And I just thought that. Yeah, really neat and um, and tidy, but it, it completely yeah threw me off a bit because it it just looks like yeah it's like a scar up, up there. I just think, why would you cut up there to go go down there? But yeah. you guys look at your scars now and sort of feel quite proud that you got through that. Yeah, because I look at mine, I really kind of look at mine and I'm like, this that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a reminder, isn't it? It's a big reminder of of um, of what you've been through and. Um, yeah. I wanted to, I was trying to think of like a tattoo, but then I was like, well, I get it tattooed. Like it's. Yeah, I want to get a tattoo on mine, but mine's just yeah. a massive straight line down my stomach. So it's well, this, like, yeah, what exactly. Do with that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I opted for one on my ankle instead that represents what I've been through. But uh, because obviously that's 
covered up all the time. So I was like, it's a bit pointless anyway. But um, I was like, I'm going to cover my scar. That's it. I'm getting a massive tattoo to cover it. But now yeah. I'm like, no, I'm going to, I want to get one round. There's a quote I want to get. I said to you about it, you know, Rob, that I want to yeah, get, yeah. But, like not covering it, but like above and below it. Nice. But, I mean, I, I hate it. I don't yeah. think I ever. Did it bother you? Know, uh, you probably point. had the more invasive one, I would guess, out of all of us, because mine was just at the start. Rob's was on his, you know, yeah. groin area. Yeah. Did you definitely more invasive for a bra? Like the way it is, it's a perfect shape, but it's higher than my bra, so it's like you can see it. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. In the summer, you're going to see where it comes up here as well. Like, it's, yeah, there's a big. It sounds it sound stupid because if it wasn't for that scar, like I wouldn't be here, would I? Well, exactly. Yeah, it would be much worse. Yeah so. yeah. so I do try and embrace it, but mm. that is something I do struggle with. Yeah, yeah. Chris, I was quite you... surprised. Sorry. I was going to say, did you grow up with anybody around? Just going back to what we were talking about before, did you have anyone in your family or any friends that had it before you? Nope. So no, no, didn't know anyone. Um, I've heard of people through people, but never heard anyone in my yeah. uh, direct line as such yeah, who yeah, had yeah. it. And I, yeah, was a bit naive like you, sort of just, yeah, going through life thinking, oh, well, I'll never get that until I'm older. So yeah. even yeah. even in my even in my family, like there hasn't been much can like the the only cancer cases that have been have been like, like in the over seventies. Mm. So it's not even like there was like a random case here and there or whatever. But you know. The, the cancer I had um, was an incredibly rare one as well. But again, lucky because very treatable. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, you know, they say that there's only 40 women in a year in the UK that have this one. Really? It's, wow. Yeah, it's really, really rare. Um, it's actually the um, same cancer as a testicular cancer, but from the ovary. So I technically had the same cancer as you, Rob. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How many, um, many women? <laughs> how many women have had that? Yeah, not many. There was um, <laughs> one of you, I can't remember which, who it was I spoke to out of, out of the two of you, but someone had said just the other day um, that your, your surgeon or your doctor had said, oh, if you could get a cancer, this would be the one, the one you want. That was me. Is that you? <laughs> oh, actually. Was yeah. it you as well, Joe? Yeah, mine said, uh, other than not having cancer, this is the next best thing. Exactly what they said to me as well. Exactly yeah. what they said to me. Well, it's mad, isn't it? Because no one wants cancer. Yeah, it Which made me it? feel really good, but it seems like he tells everybody yeah. that. So uh, maybe not. Yeah. Well, I was like, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Because it's, it's with um, the testicular cancer and the one I had, it's the same cell type. It's a germ yeah. cell. So, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's exactly the same cell type that causes the problem, but it just doesn't happen in women very often. Mm. Mm. Um, but in men, it happens more. So it, it's, it's kind of weird to think that I pretty much had testicular cancer and I don't have testicles. <laughs> you well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always knew I was special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, God. So, so what sort I, of questions do you guys get asked? Because I get asked all the time. Basically, the one question I get asked the most is, how did you know? And I'm like, I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. I just felt it and it felt odd and I felt odd and it just it was like I knew but I didn't know and I didn't, but I didn't want to accept it so so what what do people ask you same how did you how did you know how did you find it did you check yourself mm. um, yeah and another thing as well people always say to me oh you look really well because I think there's oh, always God. a thing isn't there like all the time you just I don't know you just think you think you think of cancer and you think of people that really frail really poorly and yeah. my mum didn't look like that really like she lost her hair for chemo but she never really looked poorly poorly but um yeah people say to me oh you look so well it's like but you can't I felt well I yeah you know even when I had radiotherapy I, I felt a bit sick and that but I think that was more anxiety yeah. than anything from the radiotherapy mm. um but yeah like yeah people say it all the time oh you look really well it's like <laughs> but I'm you know it's still yeah. huge like yeah. it's you've been through this massive life-changing thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah no same as you like how did you know how did you find it how did you know and you look well yeah what about you chris what they say to you? is that a similar thing same things but i also get asked about my fertility as well because obviously i went through chemo and it's oh. to do with ovaries right so 
people who are more brave will ask me whether I am still able to have children, whether yeah. I still have periods, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can still have children. They recommend that uh, my wait two years because um, that's the reoccurrence is okay. the worst in the two years, but it's still yeah. very low and um, they're not yeah. too concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, because the, the, everyone, I don't know, some people know that, like, when you have your two ovaries, one ovary deposits an egg at a time, so they're doing, like, bi-monthly cycles. Yeah. And they're like, how does this work now? And I'm like, well, this ovary just works really, really hard now and does every <laughs> cycle. <laughs> so yeah. my poor left ovary's got double the work now. But the only, yeah. the only long-term effect of that is I will go through the menopause a bit early because okay. it's just lost, or, you know, it's generated its eggs and it will run out of time, basically, yeah. bit quicker. Yeah. So I'm so not to say that I could go through menopause early as well, because like, that yeah. can put you into menopause, but still waiting for that. <laughs> That's reminding me, actually, Christy, I get asked that quite a bit about, uh, yeah. well, can you still have kids? I get asked from a mate a bit more crude questions, but... Uh, yeah. You know, having having only got one, they're like, oh, is it is it any less? I'm like, no, no, no. You literally <laughs> just need one. It's fine. Um, but I went through um, all so before in in the very very short time between being told I had it and having the operation, I had to go to a sperm bank and deposit sperm in this bank in Manchester, which yeah. they honestly the documentation I had to go through was like a fifty page <laughs> dossier of like where it went if I died and all, all kinds of stuff like, um, yeah, where it, where it goes when I die, if I die, um, all that kind of thing. And there was all sorts we had to talk about. And I went there with my girlfriend. We sat there talking literally for ages. And I said, right, okay, we're going to store um, half of it in this tank in wherever, half of it in this tank in Manchester, because if there's ever a disaster and this tank gets blown up or breaks or whatever, you'll still have some saved here. All right, okay. And then they give me all the levels. And then I had the operation, had the shot of chemotherapy, and then two or three, maybe more than that, a number of weeks after that, I had to go back in, deposit again, same way, same document. That's going there, that's going there. These are the levels versus how they were before. And actually, the levels in there were higher after the operation, uh, which was was a bit weird. So, so yeah, that question comes up a lot. People say, oh, you know, is it like, is it less chance of getting somebody pregnant or like, no, it's, it's if anything, it's probably more, but you, you, you need one <laughs> and you're all right. And if it doesn't, there's loads frozen anyway, that's, that's there um, with, uh, you know, I think they keep it for like 50 years or something. So um, wow. you could, you know, if you needed to, you can always go and literally like there's, a, there's this signed document that says who can have it and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, so, so I get asked that quite a lot, but no touch wood, um, it's had, I've got no kids at the minute, but um, yeah, there's nothing, no no side effects or anything like that on uh, on that. No, because I think a lot of people, like in my case as well, um, obviously I've had had one ovary completely removed, mm-hmm. um, but you know we're lucky in the sense that we have two testicles and two ovaries, so <laughs> exactly. we have the backup option. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a lot of people are actually more interested in whether you can have kids after chemotherapy with me because they know obviously. Okay. It puts a really massive impact on your body yeah. and whether your body can actually deal with that is another question but yeah. what they they do is to protect your ovary by basically giving you this massive injection which is like an unreal needle i've seen anything oh. like it well, you might yeah. have seen me post something like about that I think I did the other day, yeah. it's an absolute yeah. beast <laughs> needle um so and it puts your ovary to sleep so you go into a state of men uh, like temporary menopause basically wow. uh, I had like all the hot sweats going on and everything. I was like, you know, having proper menopause symptoms. And then, yeah, just a couple of months ago, my periods returned like normal and everything. And I had a scan and they could see eggs in my ovary. So everything's returned back to normal. But they just like shut it off so that the chemo can't attack it, basically. Mm -hmm. It's amazing Um, what you do, isn't it? It's it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. crazy. Christy, was yours anything to do with the fact that you'd just been pregnant? No. Or not? Nothing at no. all, just complete so, coincidence. I thought it was at first, um, but no, it's not. Apparently, um, this cancer I had actually typically affects people in their teenagers. So I was a bit late to the, the party, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> um, they typically, um, people below 30, I was 29 at the time. 
Mm. Um, and yeah, they seem to see it in people in their teen and teenage years the most. Um, yeah. They don't know why. Um, it doesn't typically affect people that are older. Yeah. Um, but again, like reiterating, you know, just because you're young doesn't mean to say it's not going to prey on you, right? There's specific yeah. cancers yeah. that will prey on you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But no, it's nothing to do with the pregnancy. Um, yeah. But the really, the really, uh, this is a really interesting fact, right? So the the, the cyst that I, I had had a tooth inside of it. <laughs> really, a tooth yeah. inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the same cells that make the baby so when right. they, they they just go cray cray and then all of a sudden like wow. you know they're making bits and bobs of like yeah. there, there was like all neural tissue or there's some eye tissue in there a weird oh. crap in there and yeah. there was a tooth i was just like one had had hair in it because i yeah through a bit the and and dermoids, yeah yeah the dermoids <laughs> cyst is so strange and Apparently they get people to ask, people asking when they have like the non cancer demos, they get people asking whether that was like the baby's twin or whatever. <laughs> so was that your first, first kid, Christy? Like yeah, it was child? my first. Yeah. Because okay, I was going to say. Going, oh, go going back to, um, we were talking about, um, you know, like, you know, signing documents and everything before you went for mm -hmm. surgery and stuff. Well, you guys got options of like, prosthetically how you could do things and whatnot yeah. i got another option which was uh, which or which parts of my body was i okay with them taking out just in case it had spread Did so <laughs> it was like so i had my ovary um so was i okay with them taking the ovary was i okay with them taking my flovian tube was i okay with them doing a hysterectomy if they felt that it was reasonable was i okay with them taking um basically this thing called the omentum which is like your um stomach uh, mm. lining just <clears throat> underneath the stomach and over your intestine i just sign all the health i was like just take what you want yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i think uh, you, you just think take what you need like to save me isn't it yeah. really i yeah, said to the yeah. surgeon I, it's absolutely crazy now thinking back to it because i've i always had in my mind i'm gonna have two children right so i've got one child now but when I was in that situation, I just turned around to the surgeon and said, if you have to take it, just take it. I can live with one child. I was just like, <laughs> so frank. I was like, I can't. Yeah, I need to be good. here for her. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. now I'm just like, it, I'm amazed that they've been able to save. Because especially with ovarian cancer, they usually do do a hysterectomy if you're like, you're past the sort of fertile age. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like, well, there's no point in keeping yeah. it in there. Yeah, really yeah. It's only young people like me, that they actually attempt to keep one ovary alive basically yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's crazy like what you have to sign off and as well with the um, I was actually quite surprised because as I told you my cyst was absolutely humongous and it mm. came out and I, I woke up from the surgery thinking that they were going to have cut literally like my entire stomach up but they've only gone from my belly button down to the, the sort of top of my pelvis so oh. they're really about maybe that big yeah, yeah. But they managed to get this absolute beast out of it and i'm just like yeah. how did they do that i don't know they really are i don't yeah. know how they done it and i still to this day i'm absolutely gobsmacked by modern medicine i really am yeah, i think it's, it's amazing so it so a lot of yours then obviously you you had a lot of determination because you'd had a baby um your kids a little bit have you got, you've got kids haven't you joe yeah i've got two they're 11 and 12 how did um, they take it? They were fine, like, so, because they give you all this documentation in the hospital, like how to tell your children, how to, mm. like, word it and everything. And they knew I'd been to the hospital, but not, like, a little while before that, I'd hurt my foot running or something. So I told them that I was going to the hospital for that to start right. with. Okay. And then obviously when I got diagnosed, I was like, I've got to tell them, because I was at the hospital, going to the hospital every week, and I thought, I can't, I can't yeah. be lying to them. Um, so my little boy, he's, he's 12, he just sort of like went, all right, and then carried on playing on his phone. <laughs> and then my little girl, the first thing she said to me was, mummy, am I going to get it now? Because nanny had it and you've had it. And oh, like that yeah. broke me because just, well, did, yeah. you know, that, that's the first thing she's, 11 years old, that's the first thing she's thought of. And yes. so I explained to her about like genetic testing and that. And I said, I'm going to be my laptop in. And, um, you know, if you are, if you are at risk, then we deal with it. Like there's things we can do, um, and then they both. But they both said to me, like, "Mummy, Nanny beat it, and she was older than you, mm. so if Nanny can beat it, and she's old. <laughs> you can beat it." 
they, they, yeah. they were brilliant. They were so good. Yeah. Like they, they, and then I'm, afterwards, they were like, you're all right now, Mum, aren't you? You're all right. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel lucky that, um, well, again, that word lucky is a little bit of a term, but um, mm -hmm. I feel kind of, I'm glad that my daughter was young enough that she won't remember any of this. Like, and I didn't have to yeah. explain any of this to her. The yeah. only thing I would say that it, it kind of just ripped away my mum privileges for a few months because I, I didn't, yeah. I didn't yeah. really get to experience being with her for about four months properly. And... I have to say like mentally I did kind of start breaking away a bit from it because I was scared that I wasn't going to make it through the chemotherapy at points and I didn't want her to become so attached to me and then me to just dis disappear mm -hmm. so I, it was a real again mental health wise it's just course, yeah. It's, yeah it was horrendous so um but yeah I think you know when she's older and she's old enough to understand well of course tell her what happened yeah. and things but yeah. one of the things i did ask the specialist is is this like a genetic thing is this something that could carry down but in my case it's not so um i'm pleased about that but i'm still going to be telling her to make sure if she gets yeah. voted to go to the doctor yeah, so. yeah you're going to be yeah. pushing her to the doctors at every every possible thing but <laughs> yeah. i do that anyway but <laughs> yeah if you go and they go oh it's nothing you go all right okay well fair enough then, yeah. <laughs> all, all they've said for like Mike, so when our mum got diagnosed, I you normally get mammograms, I think, when you're 15, I think it is. Mm. And they said that me and my sister needed them from the age of 40. Um, so that would have been this year. But um, that they've said that for my daughter now as well. Like she, um, uh, like when mm. she's 40, like when she's about 38, she should go to the doctor, let the doctor know the family history, and then mm. be checked from when she's sort of 40. Yeah. And yeah. that. So. But yeah, I'm so glad that genetic test was negative. Like that was not, not yeah. even for like the, the chemo side of it, just the fact that, oh my God, I could be past, like, passing this on to my daughter like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. One oh, thing man. I've been thinking about, which, you know, will happen with you guys further down the line, I guess, when, when you're sort of where I'm at now, is that just recently my last CT scan was uh, November. And that's my last, I have one every year. The last one I'm going to have was November just gone. Um, and I went back in March and he said, yeah, CT scan's fine. Um, we're now going to extend your, your visits to like six, seven months. And now I'm almost a bit like, well, I, I quite like this reassurance. Every three months I get a blood test, an x-ray on my chest and, and meet with somebody who's a cancer specialist who says, no, you're, you're all good. You're looking, everything's looking really good at the minute. And I, I don't know how much I'm going to struggle in, because basically now I've got every six months now for two years and then that's it. But there's no more CT scans. There'll just be a blood test every six months. Um, and then, yeah, when I get to the fifth year, they'll sign me off. And I'm a bit like, I don't really want to be signed off. I quite like the fact that I get to come in and because, like I said before, nobody else, none of my friends are out there getting tested for yeah. cancer or anything bad every three months. So I've become accustomed to like, this is quite nice, actually, this reassurance every three months. Somebody says, yeah, you're absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. Whereas, you know, I've got mates who've never, ever had a chest x-ray, never had a CT scan, or never had a blood test. So, so, and I think, like, at least I know for sure at the minute there's nothing yeah. because I get tested so often. But when, when I've finished that, I'm, I'm going to be a bit like, I want, I want a test. Like, yeah, I, want a, I want that reassurance. I've, I've got used yeah. to that reassurance of, of somebody telling me that I'm fine. And um, I think that's what I'm potentially going to struggle, with, especially now that they're like, oh, no, you don't need to come back very often. It's obviously great news because it means you're that far down the line that there's even less chance. Now, I think it's after yeah. year two or year three that is like the chances are even slimmer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm a bit like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I mean, it's got to happen at some point, hasn't it? But, um, but yeah, just a bit like... I think as well, you get, it's like, in our cases as well, we were just, like, it was a shock. Every, all of us were, it was just complete shock, came out of nowhere, mm. um, you know. it. I think you get thrown into this world of cancer, like, all of a sudden. Really? And you just, like, at the beginning, you're just, like, trying to keep your head above water and just swimming. And you're mm. just like, oh, my God, like, what am I doing? And then you're you're following the the only way you can get through it is to follow the doctor's orders basically yeah. and speak to people as you go through. So then, you know, when you're doing a surveillance now, and mine's quite in, intense. I see someone once a month at the moment, so it's, it's quite intense, but mm. I can imagine that because you've kind of been thrown into this world, 
then you've tried to swim. The only, the only way you've found that you can swim is to follow the doctor's orders. So when the doctor then disappears, yeah. I can imagine that being quite, yeah, yeah. anxiety provoking. Because like, right. yeah. that's when I kind of broke, I think, because they warned me, yeah. they said like, you're going to have hospital appointments every week. And then once you finish your radiotherapy, that's it. You won't, you just have your yearly, so I'm on yearly checkups. You'll just have your yearly right. checkup. So yeah, literally I finished my treatment and then because of COVID as well, a lot of the um, I suppose, services that are available normally weren't there. Mm. So I've, I've never actually met my oncologist. Um, All right. Yeah. yeah so I've met, because I think when I had my first appointment, she was on holiday and then because of COVID, she just wasn't coming to the hospital when yeah. I was having treatment and that. And yeah, when I finished my radiotherapy, that's when I just broke because for two weeks I was going to the hospital every day so I was driving from um Chesham into London going to the Royal Free every day and like yeah that that was taking like two hours in the traffic and that to get there and get home mm. and then yeah after the two weeks it was just nothing you just get dropped and it's like what do I do now <laughs> like where, where am I meant to go like who's who's going to help me now like you just I think you're like you say you just swimming 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 keeping your head above water and then yeah I just drowned I just totally yeah. totally drowned yeah. crazy but we're all still here fortunately all live to tell the tale and raise awareness and uh it's amazing like we're all individually we've basically we've come together i mean we've never met each other but we've just come together through the power of social media and the fact that you know i've followed both of your stories with interest because of my own story and people are out there following me and and it's just it's amazing really. that is you know social media gets a bit of a, a bad rap in in a lot of ways but there are times when you think, you know what, it's, it's helped, yeah. you know, like me and Chris were talking. And, yeah, me and you have spoken. The amount of people have, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been amazing for me, really. And, and now I just take a load of, of uh, gratitude in people reaching out to me and going, if just anything, like, how did you find it? Or how are you now? Or how often? Anything. What's the Christie like when you go there? I get all sorts. And, and, I'll just be like, look, I'll tell you all about it. What do you want to know? I'll tell you everything. I'm open to talking like, about it. I feel like we've been given like, well, not an experience we ever wanted, but we've been given an experience that other people our age particularly haven't mm. experienced, right? Yeah. So I feel like we're kind of more knowledgeable than most about this mm. sort of world. And so yeah. I like to give back and I've, I'm supporting quite a few people at the moment who've been diagnosed yeah. with cancer recently. Not the same one as me, but just yeah, going yeah. through the same process and I think it just helps having that person to talk to who's been mm -hmm. through a similar experience yeah. and I also found as well like as you say social media gets bad rap but actually it's amazing in some cases because I found this um, group called Mummy Star which were, is dedicated to women who get cancer within the first year or during pregnancy yeah. and um, they they had this forum and it is just outstanding like I the amount of times I went in and then wrote something and I got answers that I needed at the time to like help yeah. with my anxiety and things I mean but there was one time when they told me I needed to have a blood transfusion and you know that that to me sounded like a really big deal like I was really ill and, you know whatever I went on the group and said has anyone had a blood transfusion before what did you think and the first answers I got were I felt like a new woman the next day and, <laughs> I, and then I was like I was like, actually, this is not that bad. I might actually feel better from this. So, yeah. But I yeah. think also at that time, I clued in that going to hospital made me feel more ill. So, yeah. <laughs> well, your, your Facebook at the minute, Chris, is amazing. You're, so you're doing, you, do you do a picture every day, is it? Is it every day or every week you do a, you every do a picture? Every day this month, yeah. Every I'm day this a, month. And, it's, and some of them are quite, some of them are yeah. quite like intense pictures, aren't they? Like that one with the big needle. It's like, which is a good thing because it's there to, like yeah. people take note and it shocks you. I wish I'd have taken more pictures now because there's some things yeah, I'm yeah. saying that I don't really have a picture for, but I yeah. just said so I could complete that more. But there's yeah. yeah, there's a few on there that are quite harrowing pictures and it's like good. things that happen. Like today, there's one on there. I actually suffered a psychotic episode um, okay. whilst on chemo, and it's explaining all about like how that happened and things so like that. And, yeah trying yeah. to tell people that actually you know one in five chemo patients do suffer psychosis yeah. so it, you know and i'm trying to go into those worlds that are kind of taboo to talk about because i think mm -hmm. a lot of people um when they get diagnosed with cancer they almost feel um i don't know they, they, i 
you, you this is not the word I want to use you kind of feel tainted like like always like dirty and you can't scrub something off like yeah. so yeah. so they don't want to talk about it because they just they don't feel comfortable with what the way their body is at the moment and yeah. stuff yeah. and what their body's done to them and yeah. I I really want those posts that I'm doing to kind of break through those barriers and go like yeah. this is actually what happens exactly. I'm going to talk about it in your face because no one else talks about it and you yeah, need to know this yeah so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's no, exactly. my, my thing <laughs> and Joe you're doing something totally different you're I, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it you're helping somebody who's writing a book is that right yeah so um there's a there's a lady on in, Instagram um I'm not helping her write it as such. No, she, you've, um, you've given her a piece too. Yeah, so she um, basically, she, she went through breast cancer, I think she said five years ago. And she found, the, like me, that after the treatment bit, sort of the worst period for herself. And there was nothing there to help her through that stage. So she wanted to write a book, sort of gathering, but not just from her own experience, from other people's experiences as well. Um, sort of what, what feelings and emotions they went through when they finished treatment and sort of how they felt. So yeah, I had a good phone conversation with her a couple of weeks ago and she, I think it was last week, she sent through a few quotes that she's sort of picked out that she's going to use in the book. Um, and I just think like something, if I had had something like that, I think it would have helped me. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm not very good at sort of reaching out to people if I'm struggling, I'll just try and bury it and carry on until I just completely self-implode but <laughs> yeah so i think having a book like that i mean that would have been valuable to me i think mm. so yeah. it's like on that um on that mummy star website as i was talking about they they actually have um some of the mums have written books for children um like so like children's books but to kind of explain to them what's going on okay. so like wow. like you, you're saying you were trying to explain to your kids what's going on like so they give them yeah. this book as a starting point and such and I think that's just so invaluable. Like, because yeah, yeah. you, you, you know, how do you start a conversation like that without being completely frank about what's going on? Like, it's just, it's impossible, especially in cases where people are terminally ill. Like, how do you start that conversation? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. just heartbreaking. So, can't even imagine. Yeah. I literally can't so, even imagine. So, they, they do all this sort of stuff and they do lots of, yeah. um, like, you know, people writing things and stuff. It's, it's amazing. It, I'm so glad I found that group um, and obviously uh, the Shine group as well uh, mm. because I would have been lost otherwise. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, great. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll wrap it up there because I know we've been on ages here. Um, yeah, I was yeah. looking at time going, oh, <laughs> Good talk all day. <laughs> You're still, maybe we'll have to do it again. Like in a few weeks, we'll do it again and talk yeah. about something different. But I think it's, it's about, we're all in it for the same reason. We're all trying to raise awareness and, we're all doing that, you know, your Facebook. Is, are you on Instagram as well, Christy, or are you just Facebook? I am on Instagram, but I don't really post much about no. cancer stuff on Instagram. Yeah. But I was actually thinking of setting up an Instagram page dedicated to my cancer journey. Yeah, do, and it. Stuff. do it. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the opposite to you, so I don't really post anything on Facebook, but my Instagram, although it's now a running page, but early on, it's you know, and, and now and again, it does relate back to, you know, like three years ago today was, was this. So it's, mine's kind of there to highlight to people, not the journey I went through, but where I've been since then. So it's kind of a bit like, if you've just come out of the back end of it and you're feeling like, you know, shit and whatever, there is a way that, you know, there is a, a sort of a life after this that, you know, you can, whether it doesn't have to be running, just general fitness or whatever you want it to be, um, but yeah, from, from my sort of, as soon as I could really, I started running and, and I've never stopped and now I'm doing marathons and all kinds of things. But, um, and, you know, people think, oh the hell, you had cancer like three years ago and now you're running a marathon. And, and that's kind of the message I want to get across. Like, don't, just because you've had it doesn't mean that you're like, you can't stop, get to those levels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think we're all doing the right thing. We're all raising awareness and, I said, I'll send this video to you both and share it wherever you want. Uh, I'm going to share it on my Instagram. And, and if one person watches it or watches a bit of it, because it's quite long, I don't know if I'd watch an hour and 20 minutes, maybe, <laughs> um, and, and decides, you know what? Yeah, I'm a bit worried about something. I'm going to go to the doctors and, and you know, helps them in some way. Then, then I think we're, we're doing our job, aren't we, really? So that's, that's I did a post on Facebook when it was like Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And mm. that was the first time I sort of come out and said, actually, like, this is what I'm going through. 
Yeah. And somebody I used to work with, she said to me, oh, after seeing your post, I checked myself and I found the lump. So I'm going to the doctors to get it checked. So, you know, just, you know, that, that meant the world to me. I thought, it really it? does. Yeah. Like, it is just, that's all I want to do. If I can save just you, one person, like. Potentially saved a life. It's crazy. Yeah. You literally mm -hmm. potentially saved that woman's life. Like, yeah. it is, it's crazy. But like I said, hopefully this raises awareness and encourages people that, you know, you can be young and you can get it and there's no shame, especially guys out there in going and just getting checked out, like, or checking yeah. yourself out. Or yeah. just Google Google what you need to look for or ask yeah. any of us what you need to look for and, and we'll tell you, but um, but don't ignore it um, is, I guess, the main thing. But, yeah. yeah, we'll do this again. We'll we'll life after, uh, we'll make the next one life after uh, chemotherapy or whatever and see where, where we're up to and what we're doing. Yeah. I was going to say, you, um, you hear this video is like an hour and 20 minutes long. Yeah. You no. probably like cut it down into smaller sections or yeah, something. Yeah, I'll, like, I'll, I'll, I'll work some out. I'll try and trim yeah, it off. Yeah, because... <laughs> I know if I was listening to this, I wouldn't listen for an hour and twenty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'd want to watch bits of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do with it. But um, yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. But but it's all been really engaging and, and interesting. I've learned loads, and if you have yeah, got too. time, it's worth worth watching, isn't it? But last thing before we go, your hair, Christy. That's you shaved that yourself, didn't you? So this isn't. A, is this a result of? So your hair grew back from chemotherapy and then did I see that yeah. you chosen intentionally to shave it off again as like a, a thing? No, no, no. I, I shaved it off just before the chemo. So this is just grown back from after this the chemo. Right, basically. okay. okay. Yeah. So I, I intentionally shaved it off because I didn't want cancer to take it. That so was it, right, okay. I, it, it okay. took some control back to me because I was getting fed up with cancer taking yeah, yeah, yeah. this out of every part of my life. So <laughs> I was just like... You're not taking the hair. I'm taking it. <laughs> I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> it's your time to take it. Well, it, it suits you. You look, you look amazing with it. It actually suits you. Thank you. Um, um, but yeah, I, I knew I'd read something that it wasn't chemotherapy relating, that you'd done something intentionally yourself to, to get rid of it. So, um, yeah. Cancer shit my ovary. It's not taking my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, yeah. God, yeah. So, it took a little bit of something off all of us, hasn't it? yeah <laughs> <laughs> but no thanks a lot girls and yeah like i said hopefully it's raised awareness and, and people are watching and thinking i need to do that and um yeah and hopefully it works out and and we'll uh yeah we'll we'll connect at some point again i'm sure yeah lovely to meet Great. you joe yes. yeah thank you. You too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 right guys thanks a lot all right see care, ya. Guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.